do a little bit of Young's modulus at the end, more on that later. And you remember last time we did a problem, maybe I'll show it to you. Oh, whoops, this is gonna start. Can you go grab me that boom back there while I'm dealing with this? The At the back of the classroom, the boom with the scale. Yeah, there we go. That thing, yeah. Thank you. Remember last time how we didn't get the numbers to match up on this? You remember that? I figured out what it was. I read the wrong number off the back. There were two heights listed, 28 and 42. It literally was, we used 28 when we were supposed to use 42. I redid it in the other class and we got something like 5.7 and the result we found was 5.5. So I just wanted to remind you that in case you're wondering why this didn't match up very well, it was because I gave you an incorrect number. Got it? So it, it does work out and we could redo it, but um, if you need to see that, I'll get you the section of the live stream from the later class. It absolutely does work out when you plug in the right distance. All right, so just wanted to let you know that. And while I've got this here, you might be wondering why there's two heights. Give me just a sec. This problem, is designed to be done in another way, like this, and like this, where you have this mass at a different spot. And so I know that's maybe a little bit hard to see uh, on Zoom, but hopefully you can kind of see that a little bit. Maybe I'll uh, just so you can see a little bit better. Hopefully you can see it now a little bit. So the idea is this mass is not sitting on the ground there. Um, the same problem has a lot more technical details in it. And this is more like the exam level difficulty. So everything we did last time was kind of a preparation for this problem. If we can get this problem really well understood, I think your odds of kicking ass on the exam question are very good. So we're gonna do this one first while you're fresh and try and make sure we do this really well and then later at home, redo it so you see all the issues, okay? That said, what problem is this in the workbook? Can you find it? It says draw bridge. 12.7. Okay. 12.7, page 103. Thank you. So even though it seems very similar to before, there's a lot of nuances in this one. 103, you said. Got it. Drawbridge. All right. And let's see. We're going to go like this. Actually, I'm going to turn the front light on. I forgot to do that last time. So this one has all the same elements as your exam questions, I'm confident, all right? Um, almost all of them. These, the next two problems will have all of them. So we got a Y, X. And now it's a little bit trickier because nothing's at right angles. And that's kind of like real life where you don't always get real life on right angles all the time. Oops. Pretty good. We're told that this distance here is Y. There's a extra mass on here. Was it 5M or something? Oh, in this case, I said 2M, whatever. Okay. So there's a 2M sitting on here. And that one has some distance. I'm going to make these distances stand out. I'm going to draw them in blue, okay? Or 
What's the length of the rod? Did it say? Oh, the rod has length L. All right. Sorry, I'm a little crooked. I'm drawn at an angle on a whiteboard. It's, it's a little tricky sometimes. I think that's a little off. I think that's a little better. Sorry about that. And notice I'm trying to take great care with my pictures. There's, there's just no way around it. You have to be, you have, your pictures have to be somewhat accurate. Now there's a bunch of labels, a bunch of angles labeled here, I think. Is this one beta down here? Yeah. Well, it's in, no, beta is in the triangle. Oh, beta is in the triangle. Okay. Sorry about that. And then up here is alpha. And then this is probably theta. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. I appreciate that. Well, in that case, before we do much, I want to go over something. Usually we want to draw one picture and use this picture to understand all the distances and angles. Okay. And this is going to be critical on test day. So what is this angle that I drew in? It's not beta. What is it? 90 minus theta. Okay. Just trying to point out that it's not 90 minus beta in this case, right? Now, what's this angle right here? The red dot, what's that angle? Would that be 180 minus theta? That's 180 minus theta. So this is a complementary. What you've been doing in your mind, I don't know if you realize it, and maybe you do, right? This one. There was a right triangle here, right? And so you're like, okay, these three angles add up to 180. Over here, these two angles have to add up to 180 as well, right? Because this is a line, so the two angles add up to 180 degrees. So that's going to be 180. You should probably be putting that degree symbol on there, not just writing 180. Cool. Now, if you learn one trick out of this problem, right, here's, here's a big deal. What we could do is we could take this non-right triangle and turn it into a right triangle if we use this dotted line and this side. So I want to point out, it's kind of sloppy here, but maybe if I do this, What is this dimension right here going to be? How long is this side of this giant right triangle? How long is this side? L sine theta. What did you say? L, L sine. Sine, which angle? Uh, yeah. Which one? The circle. Oh, theta. Okay. It's hard to tell beta versus theta with the mass on, I think. Yeah. Okay, so do you agree this is opposite theta, the hypotenuse is L, everybody cool with that? Now in this problem, I believe we were, well, what's this side going to be right here? Sorry, that's sloppy. What's this length right here? All cosine theta. Yep, and I'm a little bit off the screen, so give me just a second. Oh, sorry, sorry, Jules, my bad. Thanks for heads up. My bad. Okay. Just that fits on the screen, just barely. And then in this problem, I believe the problem statement told us that y is equal to two thirds of L, didn't it? Is that true or am I wrong? In this problem statement, does it say y equals two thirds L? Okay, got it. All right. Now, notice what we have done here. Nothing really, except just label the figure with all the lengths and distances. 
And this is why I'm doing this. Do you agree if we tried to draw your forces on here, it would be such a mess, you would have a hard time reading things? So we're gonna use this picture of all the lengths and angles to figure out any sizes we need if geometry questions come up with a question. Like let's say we need to figure out these angles to get some torques. Then I'm gonna actually draw a separate free body diagram over here. Not exactly the same. Never will be, but I could try and make it a little better. So the idea is we could do an FBD, and I'm going to call it FBD1 for torques. All right? And we're going to leave all of our dimensions on this one. That way we can actually see our diagram a little bit. Then finally, I know this is going to seem crazy. We're going to draw another FBD. And I'll explain why when we get there. If you do this procedure, you're going to get the exam question right. If you don't, you probably won't. And I wish there was a shorter way. This is just the only way I know to stay organized with all this crap. So multiple figures, you're going to get a good grade. If you don't do it, you'll probably get a bad grade. All right, at least on this question. Now. We've kind of got this thing set up. I want to read the question. Okay. We know that theta is 85 degrees. Use geometry to prove alpha is some number and beta is some number. Okay, so our goal is if theta is 85 degrees, get alpha and beta. That's our first task. This reminds me of the test question I wrote for this semester, where the first question was figure out some angles. Okay, so I'm not I'm not lying to you. This is basically straight off the test. If you look at all my practice tests, it's pretty much every there, always there. In this case, if we got to get alpha and beta, how would you approach it? Any ideas? Yeah. Well, if we're going to get alpha, we could use the facts that we have. The really a bigger right triangle from the bottom if we use one two thirds L, yeah, right there, and then L cosine theta, and then we would use sine tangent with the L sine theta at the bottom with those two lengths to find alpha. And then once you have alpha, then you just then, do yeah. the whole 180 yep, times yep. sine theta. And that's exactly it. And that's the trick. So what we what he's saying is, and I'm gonna try and reiterate it just in case the mic didn't pick you up. He's basically making a big right triangle out of this thing. And then he could do Socatello to get alpha, right? Uh, maybe use tangent of alpha to do is opposite over hypotenuse. And we've got all these things. And notice what's going to happen here. You might be saying, crap, there's a bunch of L's in here. But look, there's going to be L's everywhere, and they're going to cancel. Got it? So in this case, watch this. Tangent of alpha is equal to opposite over adjacent. What should I write for adjacent? Go ahead. What did you say it was? Uh, it would be L cosine theta plus two thirds L. Absolutely. And if we do that, even though it looks a little bit ugly, let me get this out of the way so you can see. I hope you agree the L's drop out, you punch in a bunch of numbers and we get alpha. Every term has an L in it so we can cancel out the L's. We know that theta is 85 degrees. And we use this when you punch in numbers. Take a second to punch in the numbers. I'll write it up just so we have it. I said alpha is 52.89. Right. If this is similar to your test question, this is a great time to practice it. I'll grab my calculator and do it too. So we verify we all get that angle. I don't want to be wasting time on test day, not knowing how to do the step. Everything relies on it. So I'm going to have sine of 85 divided by parentheses cosine 85 plus 2 div 3. 
close paren. And then what do we got to do? Tan inverse of that? Yeah. I got 52.885. Okay, I got you. Everybody good on that? All right. And now, I know you said it. Does anybody remember how we're going to get beta? Somebody else? What should we do to get beta? Do you remember? How would we get beta? What's that? Okay, we need a triangle that involves beta, right? This is kind of an ugly one, right? Because it's got both angles, but look at this. Does anybody want to help them out? How can we use that red triangle to figure out beta? I mean, you know, it has to up to 180. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's it. That's it. I just maybe I didn't hear you before. We know that these three add up to 180. So you just said alpha plus beta plus 180 degrees minus theta equals 180 degrees. So notice in this special case, the 180s drop out, theta moves to the other side, beta is equal to theta minus alpha. Take a second to see if you believe that. Rearrange that equation on your paper. I'll give you a second to do it. But then from there, I think it's pretty straightforward. That's a little small. Sorry, you can't see that. Let me make it bigger. So you have to do some geometry. And this shows most of the geometry tricks. Take, a, take an ob, uh, oblique triangle like this or whatever, uh, obtuse triangle, and turn it into a right triangle. Don't forget about supplementary angles. There's complementary angles. Furthermore, we could say the total angles in a triangle add up to 180, or using all of those tricks. And those are the main tricks. You got to know all of them in case one of them shows up on test day. Got it? Good? All right, all right. So out of that, what do we get for beta down here? What, what did I say it was? 32 would change or something? 32.11. Let me ask you something. Normally I say keep everything to three sig figs. Why would I keep these angles to four sig figs when that's non-standard practice? What are we gonna do later in this problem? Forces, and we may have to use these angles. So we gotta keep an extra digit so that we don't have rounding error. You know what I'm saying? So this is pretty important in your statics problem. So it's okay to keep an extra digit on these angles, and if you recall last time, you could even not figure out the angles, but just figure out sine and cosine. But in this problem, it's so complicated. I think this is the easiest way to stay organized. Great. Now we're ready to do an FBD. All that was just prep work. Help me. Give me one force acting on the rod. Gravity. Gravity. Where does that act? at the center of mass. Unless we're told otherwise, don't we usually assume the beam is a uniform material? So what was the mass of the beam in this problem? Was it M? It was. So there's gonna be a force here at the center. I'll try and get it in the center. There's MG. Good. Somebody else, give me another force acting on it. The 2M, yeah. Okay, so what force is that going to exert on the rod? Push, uh, normal force? It would be pushing the normal force down. And in this case, that normal force would be equivalent to... I guess I should be a little bit careful here. Do you agree there's got to be some friction in there as well? Oh. Now, do you agree the net effect of the friction in the normal force is to keep this mass from moving? So do you agree the net effect of the normal force and the friction are equivalent to 2mg right here? That's subtle. 
My claim is this, the board supports 2M. The net force on 2M has to balance 2MG. Therefore, the equivalent force that 2M exerts on the board happens to be 2MG. This would not be true if it was accelerating, agreed? So anytime something's accelerating, you can't do this trick. All right, what else do we have? Somebody else? Tension in the strain. Okay. Anything else? Somebody else? There's, I think, a couple more things. The uh, reaction force. Nice. Do you know which way they're going to go right now? Uh, you could think it through, but if we don't want to think it through, what direction should we draw them? On the uh, regular regular way, R X and R Y. If you don't know, don't think, don't care. Just draw R X and R Y in the standard X and Y directions. Are they even going to matter in this problem for doing torques? No. Why not? What are, What are you choosing the pivot probably? At the freaking pivot, right? So this is going to be our pivot. So those forces aren't going to matter for this diagram. They're going to matter over there. Cool. Um, I think that's all the forces, right? We got both weights. We've got the cable. We've got the reaction forces. That's it. Okay. So now we've got to deal with a lot of angles. Do you see that? We don't have a bunch of 90 degrees like the center mass calculation we started with. So let's figure out all these angles, right? In particular, if this is theta, what's this angle? So this one is going to be theta. And then over on that T, it looks like we got a beta. And I hope you see why I was trying to keep the angles separate. So now we can use this one if we had to figure out an angle, and then we can plug it in over here. And that's basically my trick for staying organized. That doesn't mean it's the best way, but it certainly helps me stay organized, and I think it'll help you. I hope so. All right, ready to do the sum of torques? What do we usually do right before we write the sum of torques? We have to determine, yeah, plus minus. So how about we say, unless you got a good reason to do otherwise, how about we say this is a plus torque? Anything down this way would be a negative torque. You know what I'm saying? And now we've got our dimensions here. We're gonna have the two MG. We're going to have the torque due to mg, plus we're going to have the torque due to the tension equals zero if those are all vectors, right? So then the idea is we're not really going to write k hats and negative k hats. We're just going to put in plus and minus signs. There's an implied k hat. Somebody that's feeling brave, anybody? Try to tell me what is the torque for 2mg. Let's start. Is it going to be positive or negative for 2mg? I heard negative. Yeah, I agree. You agree it's going to kind of twist it that way? So that's going to be a negative. I buy, I buy that. There's a negative. Then what do I do? Any form you want. You remember the torque equation? Okay, there's a 2mg in there. There would be x. Usually I write distance, force, what's the last part? Sine of some angle, right? So is it going to be sine of theta, 90 minus theta, cosine? What's it going to be in this case? Let's see. The angle between here and there looks like theta to me. Sorry, let me get this pen out of the way. Right? This is the R vector. I see a theta popping out. I agree. 
Next, torque due to mg. Somebody else try it. Is it going to be positive or negative? Negative. What's the distance? L over 2. Excellent. Because that's from the beam itself. The force is mg. And for that particular one, what's the angle? Sine theta. Sine theta. Nice. Okay, somebody else? Try the torque due to the tension. Positive or negative? Positive. It's tending to twist it up. What's the distance? L. L. What's the force? T. I guess I should be saying what's the force magnitude, but yeah. And then sign of what angle in this case? Is it beta or is it 90 minus beta? Beta. beta. Then I want to check something in the problem. Did it specify X? Nope, it didn't. So X is just X. Okay. In some problems, I say X equals L or, or L over three or something, but how did you feel on getting this equation? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Just tell me where you're at. You can do this then, right? You can ace this question on the test if you practice it. All right. Now, I know this seems crazy, but I'm going to redraw the FBD for reasons that should become obvious in a minute. I know that there's Rx and Ry. I know that there's 2mg. Why that's so squeaky? I know there's mg, and then there's t here. And this is the sneaky one. On this three body diagram, I want to split the forces into components that line up with a standard x, y axis. I want to use a standard x, y axis. What angle do I need to use for the tension? There's multiple correct answers. But if I use beta, is that going to split it up into normal x, y coordinates? It's going to be angled. Do you agree we don't want to use beta? What's that? We could use 90 minus theta. 90 minus theta? That's not going to work. That's this angle down here. Right? 90 minus theta, that would split it up. No, that wouldn't work either. We could use the combination. This is beta. This is 90 minus theta. You could use the combination. That kind of sucks though, doesn't it? What's this angle right here? <laughs> 90 minus beta. Nope. It'd be 90 minus the combination of the two. Do you agree? And that's where people screw up. That's why I like to drop, this one's sneaky, isn't it? You don't see what dot is yet, huh? Alpha. Alpha. Do you see it now? Whatever, whatever rule? You know, such good instruction here. The whatever, whatever rule. <laughs> but you know that one rule in, in geometry? This is like a line that's intersected two parallel lines, and we got the opposite, whatever, alternate interior or something like that. So you could use this angle out here 
which is alpha. And notice, if you go back to this result, 90 minus, jeez, oh, beta plus 90 minus theta is, oh gosh, yeah, that's that's it. That's the complementary angle. It's like What's that? 37.11. 37. 37.11? 37. Point 0.11. Oh, 32.11, right? No, but uh, 90 minus theta plus B. Well, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can tell you that this is going to be, the, the, you can use either one of these two combinations and then you can do the math on this one or you could do, or use that. Yes. Either one is going to work. Cool. And remember the theta was 85, not 90. That's why these don't add up to 90. Yeah. Okay. So now what I want to do is I don't like using combinations of angles if I can avoid it. So I'm just going to get rid of this crap. But that would work because we know the angles. And that's the most common mistake students make is they just grab beta and split it up. The reason I'm drawing a separate free body diagram is this one, we're splitting up the forces on a standard x, y axis so we can easily get these reaction forces. This one, we want to split it up using the right angles for torque. And the pictures look different. If you draw all three pictures, you're going to get this question right. As long as you get this one angle right. If you don't, you won't. Okay. That said, what's a good name for this force component down here? And this force component up here? Let's start with this one. What's that going to be right there? T cosine alpha, right? So what's left for this side? T sine of alpha, right? That's like grabbing this part of the triangle and just dragging it down there. It's kind of getting messy, so I'm going to redraw that part of the rod there. What do you think? Following along yet or good enough ish? Okay. So now I'm kind of running out of room. I'm going to try and squeeze it all in here. Give me the force equations in the X. And remember, we usually do rights equal left. So give me the forces to the right in this picture rx what are the forces to the left t sine alpha why this green is dying here what are the sum of forces in the y Somebody give it a shot. Let's try and do it ups equal to down. Give me the ups. Our Y. Any other ups? T cos alpha. T cos alpha. Is that all the ups? Yes. What does that have to equal? Mg. We have three equations. Usually there's three unknowns. You could solve them. I'll be straight with you. If I saw a test question like this and you had all this stuff written there, you know you're getting the most, the majority of the points. Now, usually you got to solve for something, but if you get your force equations correct, that's most of the battle here, at least 60%, 70% maybe, okay? Somewhere in that neighborhood. Feeling good? All right. Now, I don't know if you remember this strategy. Usually I write all this, then read the question and try to remember what the hell we're trying to do. So let's see. Uh, do sum of forces and torques. Okay. 
Determine tension in the cable as a function of X. Got it. Let's determine tension in the cable as a function of X. So I'm gonna come over here and write some equations. Uh, the torque equation usually gets us there. So I'm just gonna rewrite that LT sine of beta has to equal uh, mg uh, 2 mgx sine theta plus L over 2 mg sine theta. So I guess the tension is, so that's just from the sum of torques equations, in case you're wondering where I got that. I just moved the negatives to the other side. I'm going to make sure I didn't miss a typo or anything. Or we should get two mgx positive sine theta l over two. Yeah, that's it. I'm gonna back up that sine theta too. I did kind of did a lot of steps in my head. I don't usually like to do that. But with board space at a premium, I'm going to try it. I got to read through it and see if I screwed it up. What do you think I'm checking in my mind right now? Units, units exactly. So I've got an mg. Four should have units of mg. So all the rest of the units should drop out. No units, no units, meters, meters. Looks good. I got a two on the X, I got an L over two on the other one. Okay, yeah, that's looking pretty good. Could you rewrite this in other ways? Sure, but this is good enough for now. What do you think? You tell me where you put the mass, you tell me how big it is, you tell me how long the rod is, I'll tell you the tension in the cable, and then I can design the right size string to make sure this thing doesn't snap, right? Now there's a subtlety in part E. It says, suppose the block slides with constant speed towards the end of the rod. If the block is sliding with constant speed, is the acceleration of that block in this problem still zero? Yes. So even though the block is moving, we can still use that trick. I want to emphasize this. This would not be true if it's accelerating, but if you're moving this block with constant speed, the frictional force and the normal force are still balancing the weight because the acceleration is zero, right? The sum of forces are still zero on this. So we can still use this trick of saying 2mg. If it was sliding and accelerating, none of this problem would be valid, all right? We couldn't do it. It'd be approximately valid, I guess, but not exactly valid. Okay, so going back here, What we would do is, and the, it says the cable snaps if T is greater than 4mg, right? So this would tell us how far out we could put an object for the cable snaps. In this case, what might we do? We could plug in 4mg and solve for what? x so we're rearranging the same equation except just solving it for x so this is showing you a variation on how we could do this one we can punch this in we can set 4 mg is the tension max and i realize we probably wasted a little bit of time here rearranging the equation but at least it makes it easy for me to think and that sometimes saves time in the end 
What I'm saying is, if this tension is 4 mg, the cable will snap. Now we can figure out x. Well, in this case, mg's drop out. I can move some stuff around here. And it looks like I get 4 L sine beta divided by sine theta is equal to 2x plus L over 2. I could divide all terms by 2. That's going to make that a 4. That's going to make that a 2. And now I could just solve this for x. Are there other ways to do it? Absolutely. Is my way the best? No. It's just a way. It's going to be, there's going to be an L in both terms, and then there'll be a 2. I did a lot of steps in my head. I don't usually like to do that, but I'm going to check it to see. See, there's going to be an L in both terms, so I factored that out. This side, what's left? 2 sine beta over sine theta. When I bring this over, it becomes negative. And then there's a 1 fourth, and I already factored out the L. Looking good. What do you think? You find you're able to follow along with the algebra OK today, or am I killing you guys? I have no idea. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Are you able to follow along a little bit? Okay. I think your algebra is probably getting better, but there's no shame in writing a few extra steps, right? I'm trying to save space on the whiteboard so I could finish this problem and not have to keep doing this crap. That's all I'm doing. Normally, I would not want to do this. I would write it out step by step, just like you. Do. Okay. That's the key to not making mistakes. Oh, okay. Part F is a variation on this. Part F basically is asking you to figure out the largest mass you could use. So then what would you do? You'd rearrange this equation and solve it for, if I want to get the largest mass, I would solve this equation instead of for T or for X, I would solve it for M. Those are the types of variations you might see on a test question. What's the largest uh, position you can put the mass? What's the largest mass you could use for this position? What's the tension if it's at this position? Those kinds of questions. Yes. Sorry for M. Can we ask more about T? Oh, what, what did it ask for? Oh, yes, because it says, what's the mass of the largest block? So then we'd solve for M and then multiply it by 2. You're absolutely right. Yes, because the block had mass 2m in the original figure. Absolutely. Good question or good point. Yep. What do you think? Feeling okay on this? Go back to the, let's go back to the first board, right? I'm trying to go slow on this one so that you guys can basically, this is what I'm expecting to see on test it. Have a picture for doing your diagram, for getting your lengths, your angles, whatever you got to do, your geometry over here. Have a separate picture doing the FBDs for torques. And then, while it's not required, I highly recommend a third FBD where you actually split up this force using the normal XY coordinates instead of trying to do it in your head off this picture. Again, if you try and do that over here, there's just the picture gets messy. You're more likely to make a mistake. And I mean, you know how to do this if you just take your time on the pictures. That's where you want to invest your effort. Good? The algebra, you're going to fly through it. Good? Okay. If you're curious, I guess we could punch in the numbers, but... Oh. Uh, that's a 4 and not a... Uh, it's not quite... Uh, I'd have to think a little bit. We could do numbers later if you want to actually match this up. Okay. For now, I think it's more important that we go on to the last piece of the puzzle, round objects we've done everything with these beams so far right so let me show you something here whoops not there and then i'm going to be right i guess i'm right uh yeah i'm looking at that basketball
Okay, and so you may want to come over and be able to see here. So yeah, just while I'm talking for a second. So here, this is a very strange basketball holding device, right? Whoa! Forgot about that uh, torque. You know what I'm saying? Oh, crap. Oh, shoot. Well, you saw what this was supposed to look like. Oh, my God. I think there used to be a red brick on that. So. Thanks. Let me get a brick for that. Hold on. Right. Yeah, shoot, shoot. Okay, this should help. Oh my goodness, that's a 40 pounder there. All right, let's try that again. Thank you. Jones, am I still on screen or not? Yeah. Okay. I think it's this one up here. It's Okay, you can reach static equilibrium this way. Got it? So, what are the forces acting on this thing? Friction. There's friction. Which way and where? Come up. Sorry, I guess you're coming up. Let me get you a, a pointer. There you go. This is going to look fancy now. Okay, so stand off the side. Where is there friction? Point with the arrows. Well, there's Yeah, there's friction holding up this spot on the ball, right? Right up in there, there's got to be friction. Where else? Or is that it? There's one right here. There's friction there. You think that friction is trying to cause it to go down the hill or hold it up? Hold it up. Yeah, so it's probably got some kind of component this way. So there's going to be two. Go ahead, hold up your arrow there on that side. There's going to be two frictions, right? What else? Which way does the normal force point? Yeah, exactly. So I'll hold this one. You get that one. There's a normal force here. There's a normal force there. Notice it's tricky with the round object. You might be thinking, which way does it point? Well, we've got this flat surface. You know it's perpendicular to here. And by Newton's third law, action reaction, the other one would have to be the same or opposite direction, right? So, and here's a trick. I don't know if you can see this. It's always going to point right at the center of the circle. That's a cool trick. So the normal forces exerted by the ball are always radially outwards. The normal forces on the ball are going to be radially inwards. That's important. That's the trick for drawing these things. Are there any other forces on the beam? Or what are the forces on the beam, not the ball? You're done. Anybody feeling brave? You want to try it? No? You want to try it? What are the forces on this thing? There's the pivot, Rx and Ry. Got it. What else? Gravity. Gravity. Which way does gravity act? Oh, yeah. And you agree we forgot gravity on the ball, but we got it. Yeah, so there's gravity acting at the center of the beam. What else? The normal force from what? The ball. Exactly. So the board pushes the ball this way. The ball pushes the board that way. Good. Anything else? Yeah. Which way is friction acting on the board? Down, right? The board's holding the ball up. So, yes, you got it. I think that's pretty much it. Feeling good on this? All right, let's go look at the math. This is problem 12.8. I love how it says in the problem, don't use the pink one. The pink one looks like it has a lot of grip. I got to erase the board. I'll catch up on soon. Try and draw your FBDs without me. Okay? Try to do it without looking at the solutions, too. Okay. 
Still racing if you're watching on Zoom. I'm just a racist. Okay. Two forces on the ball. Okay, so 12.6. Oh, let me do. Come on. 12.6. We've got some kind of incline here. There's a pivot to the board about a 60 degree. That's my attempt. I know it doesn't look very good. And then there's a ball in here. Okay. So we're supposed to do an FPD for the ball. Actually, I'm going to draw this one pretty big. Generally speaking, whenever I have a circular object and I'm doing an FBD, I'm going to crank up the size because these figures get messy. Okay. So I just want to have a big picture so I have enough room to label stuff. There's the center of it. Let me see. I call them points A and B. So there's point A over here. There's point B over here. And then there's the center of the circle. What's one force acting on the ball? Gravity, where's that? A, B, or C? C. Straight down. That would be mass of the ball times G. I'm just going to use a subscript B for the ball so I can keep it straight from board or ball and let's say plank. So I'll use MB for the ball. We use MP for the plank. So now in this case, what are the forces at point B? Remind me. Force up the board. Up the board. That force is friction. So I'll call that friction subscript B. You could call it friction two or friction one. The other one at B is a somebody was saying it over there. And B. And B. Which way? Uh, radially inward. That's my attempt to draw radially inward. So I'll call that normal force B. How about at A? What are the forces at A here? Similar, right? Could be a normal force radially inwards. And a frictional force up. This 
Uh, what is this? 12 point, sorry, what is the number? Sorry, 12.8, I wrote down the wrong number. Sorry about that. Thank you for catching that. That's how I get. Sorry about that, 12.8. Notice how hard it would be to draw this if you, if you made it too small. It's really hard to draw these normal forces. So I remember one year on the test, I made three copies of the picture and blew them up really big so that you'd have plenty of room to draw. But yeah, anyways, all right. Which forces do we need to figure out angles for? Probably B if we're doing our standard XY coordinate system. So let's try and figure out at least an angle in this picture. Hard to label this, isn't it? If you draw these things big, it's okay. Now I know I said to get the angles on a separate diagram, but in this case, I'm totally going against what I told you to do. Sorry. <laughs> I guess we can figure out angles here. What were we told? There was an angle given in the figure, right? The up, up top one. So let's use it. We know that this angle up here is theta. Well, maybe I could just do it like this. So this angle is going to be theta, and this angle is going to be 90 minus theta. And so now we've actually done what I said. We tried to use this picture to figure out the geometry. That helps me figure out what's this angle right here. It's going to be a 90 minus theta. So what do you think this angle is? That's a theta. Every other one is theta. If we're doing the right angle splits. So now we could split up our forces if we need to. We could do torques if we need to. You have three logical choices to choose for your pivot points. A, B, and C. Which pivot point choice gets rid of the most forces? If I choose A, B, or C, remember this was point B over here. I guess I don't need this now or this. Which point, A, B, or C, eliminates the most forces? How many get eliminated a day? Which, which ones? These two? You said a third one? Which one? That doesn't go through the pivot, do you agree? Yeah, I was thinking like point C. Point C is better. This gets eliminated, that gets eliminated, this gets eliminated. Point C, what do we learn about point C? If we do some of torques about point C, what can you learn? What's, we gotta pick a direction, do you agree? Unless chosen otherwise, why don't we call this a positive torque? This a negative torque. What's the equation for the torques about point C? Which is one force that causes a torque, just say one. FA, I heard FA. Is FA gonna cause a positive or a negative torque? About point C? About point C, that's gonna try and twist the ball this way. That corresponds to a negative. If I can get all the way over there, this is weird. Do you agree that FA is causing a negative torque? Okay. What's the distance? Pirate's favorite distance is? R. Yes. Okay, nice move, nice move. Touche. The force is FA. What's the angle between for this one? 90, you agree I don't need to write sine of 90, is that okay with everybody? Sine of 90 is one, you could write it. Let's do it, just in case. So we don't have to write, if it's on paper, that's less to think. Okay, 
How about the torque due to B? The force at point B that causes the torque is FB, positive or negative, according to this picture, about point C. So what's the torque equation for it? Positive. What's the distance? R. What's the force? What's the angle? What's that one? What's the angle we use? Is it theta or 90 minus theta for FB? 90 minus theta. Nope. 90. It's 90. I was trying to trick you. Do you agree it's still at a right angle? Try to mess with you. I got you. Snuck one past you there. But does that make sense why it's 90? Yeah, because it's technically. Yeah, just because there's all these angles here doesn't mean it's not still a right angle. Yeah, trick question. I argue now you're probably getting fast enough. You could kind of see this. You could, instead of always writing it like this, couldn't you also say the counterclockwises equal the clockwises? So we could have actually written this down. And a lot of times in the solutions, we get lazy and start doing that. I'll get out of the way. What did we just learn about these two frictional forces? They're the same size. Isn't that weird? I don't know about you, but when I saw this basketball sitting up here, that did not immediately jump into my mind that the two frictional forces have to be equal. But if the ball isn't twisting, that has to be true, right? It's not twisting about the center. It's not twisting about this point. It's not twisting about that point. It's crazy, right? Can we do sum of forces on this one? Let's do sum of forces on it. How about the X forces? And usually we say the rights equal the lefts. What's one force to the right? And A, are there any others to the right? I think that's it, right? Yep. Okay, so that's the rights. I have to equal the lefts. I think there's two of them. What should I write? It's not giving enough space. What's one force to the left? Yeah, yeah, give me a component. Give me a component. What was it? You said a component of FB, right? So FB times sine or cosine of something. I don't care if it's ugly, just tell me. Cosine of what? Theta. Of what? Theta. Of 90 minus. That's this upper one. Do you agree? So we need that. Okay. Let's see if I have another blue marker here. It's driving me nuts. Come on. Not that much better. Okay, what else do we have? NB cos of theta. NB cos theta, I agree. Okay, it's almost time for a break. Stay sharp. There's an important trick I want you to learn. What's cosine of 90 minus theta? Does anybody know? Sine of theta. We mentioned it at one point earlier in the semester, but I'm sure you've forgotten most of you. But there's a trick that we always use in this chapter. That's going to be sine of theta. Anytime you have a 90 minus theta, that just flips your sines and cosines, okay? If you want me to derive that, I'll do it later, not now. We got a force equation. Let's do the y's. Anybody feeling brave? Let's try and do ups equal downs. Give me all the ups. I heard of FA. I believe that. Anything else? Up. 
Yeah. Could you do that in your head? What's another simpler way to write that? He said sine of 90 minus theta, that's going to be cosine of theta. Excellent. Now I'm going to write down what you said and write down both. So what happens is with experience, you skip this step and you just go right to cosine of theta. You know what I'm saying? Because then we don't have to use trig identities in the in the calculator all the time. It's just, yeah. So it's really important. I argue it's really important to memorize that trick and use it. It's almost as useful as sine theta over cosine theta equals tan theta. I think that's that. And then there's going to be two, I think. Maybe two. No, is there, how many downs do we have? What's that? The MBG. MBG. What else? And the sine theta. I think you're right. I'm just going to check. I have no idea. Yep. Is that it for the downs? I think so. If you can write the forces and the torques, you're going to do all right. If you know sine theta equals cosine 90 minus and vice versa, that helps. If you know this trick, right, the normal forces for a spherical object tend to point radially in or radially out, depending whether you're on the sphere or the sphere is causing a force on the plank. Uh, sum of torques, right, sometimes you want to use this point, that point, this point, you want to kind of think about where you choose the point to eliminate the most forces. We've got three equations that are bearable to work with and we could learn something. All right. Now here's a weird one. Just for fun, I thought about this and I said, which way is the ball going to slip out? If this ball was on the verge of slipping, would both coefficients of friction be new that again or just one? Somebody asked this the other day, didn't they? Yeah. Fool. Why did you ask that? Now I got to talk about it. <laughs> well, if you want, just come over here and look at this. I think it's easier to show you. Just come over and take a look, and then we'll take a break. There's actually two different critical angles here, right? If I go really low, it's pretty, pretty tough to get this to stick when it's low. So, so in this case, when it's low, and I can't remember, I think it tends to rotate out like this, which means this point is on the verge of slippy. And then here's another weird one. This is a strange, horribly bad design, but you can also put it at an extremely large angle. Oh my God, it's close. Give me a second. So you could actually do this at an extremely steep angle. Now this would be a great thing to have in your garage. <laughs> Run it. Oh, whoops, I forgot to change the camera over, didn't I, Jules? Crap. Okay, I'll do it one more time for the Zoom crew. Sorry, my bad. I got so excited. But yeah, the idea is, Zoomer, sorry about that. Basically, I was showing you could get this to stick down here at a low angle. And I think at this point, it tends to slide out. And so I think you get this here versus here. I think it twists out or something. So, but yeah, so you can get this to work at a really steep angle or really shallow angle and which one's on the verge of slipping and whether it's twisting or whether it's rolling or whether it's just sliding, I don't know. But it's just a good problem to learn some FBDs on round objects. Got it? All right. So uh, questions? No? All right. I think you guys probably need a break, right? You ready for a break? Let's take a break and then we'll do one more and then I'll move on to some other stuff. So let's take a break. I got 
All right, all right. Let's see. He said he, he said he will like push to teach top three. Because right now there's a for fall there's a position uh -huh. that's like yet to be announced, and he was talking that so most likely give that class to whoever like they hire for the class. Yeah, yeah, it's complicated right now. I tell you what, we'll talk more about it after we get through some more problems. You guys ready? All right. We should teach country. I would love to. I, on my list, I might do it in five years. I don't know. I might wait for the next wave of retirement before I move over to that. Let's see. We'll see. Yeah, believe it or not, I could move over because I got a math degree and I've taught math before. And, you know, so I could just take the position if I want it. <laughs> I could. Are you listening, Ichis? I'm going to take your job. Oh, there you are. I'm taking your job, Ichis. No, no. All right. Yeah, you guys coming in or not? All right, 12.11. Let's do it. 12.11. So let's try and do something slightly practical for once. That's always nice. We do all these math calculations. Let's try and imagine this. 12.11, page 104. Kind of a contrived looking example, but I feel like there's merit. Imagine you have a curve. Okay, if there's somebody, this is a very simplified model. Now it's hard for me to do all this, so what I'm going to do is just do this. Sorry, that's not a perfect circle. It's kind of hard up here. Now, this is supposed to be a model of a person in a wheelchair. It's difficult for me to draw that. So I'm just going to draw a wheel, okay? And notice it's a circle. I'm drawing extra big. If I'm drawing extra big up here, you better draw extra big on your paper, okay? Now, in this case, obviously the center mass of the wheel is right at the center, right? But when you put a person on top of here, that's going to raise the center mass. And it's complicated, but for some reason, let's assume the center mass of the person, the wheelchair, and all the accoutrements and everything that's with it is right there. Okay, so let's say this is the center mass position. In real life, maybe it's this way, maybe it's that way, but it's probably pretty close to right there. A little above the axle. Okay. And we're told that that distance is 1.2 times the radius. So it's about 20% above the center there. Okay. What else are we told? There's a curve and we're told that the curve has some height h. The big picture here is we're going to try and think about how high could we make this curve while still making it accessible to somebody that's operating the wheelchair. If you make the curve too high, obviously if the curve was 16,000 miles high, they couldn't get over it, right? If it's two or three feet, they're probably going to have trouble. So ultimately what we're thinking about here is what value should we use for H so that a normal human being could actually get over the curve? And anything that needs a taller curve than that for drainage or whatever issues, you better make a ramp, right? So let's try and analyze this situation. What else do we know? Oh, the person, a typical human, so maybe we don't know what this number is, so we're going to stick a variable on it. And then we can do some research, right? We can bring in a bunch of people, do some statistical analysis. So somehow we could get a number for this eventually, but for right now, because we don't know the number, let's put in a variable. Let's say a person can exert force F tangent to each wheel. And I wanna make sure I said that right. At the top of each wheel, okay.
the total mass of all that crap, the human, the chair, any books they're carrying, is going to be centered right here, and the total mass is going to be m. We're trying to figure out the maximum height for the curve. All right. Now I know this is going to seem a little bit spacey here, but there's a trick when you're doing this problem. Let's start going through the forces and then I'll tell you the trick. And to be clear here, here's the ground. Put some shading on it. Somebody tell me one force that's acting on this uh, wheelchair and total mass M. What's one force acting on? What's always there? MG, right here, right? I'm going to draw the center of the circle a little bit bigger so I can see it. That's the center. Okay. Another force. Anybody? Ground. ground. What is what force is the ground going to exert? Which way? Now I'm going to get a little spicy here. I'll call that N1. If you're going over the curb, if you're actually going to go over this curb, how big is this normal force? It's zero because you're going to lift off the ground and go over the curb. You agree you're going to swing like this? So this normal force, while present when you're on the ground, should go to zero. Sort of like what's the speed at the top? You set the normal force to zero. If you're going to get lift off here, right? If you're just barely able to get over the curb, this normal force should be very close to zero, right? If you can't get over the curb, then you would have the normal force. So by setting the normal force at the floor to zero, we should be able to get the limiting case of getting over the curb. Is that enough on that? All right. Any other forces? Friction, where? Okay. Uh, at which point? Wherever the bottom is. Right here? Bottom point. Oh, but there it's going to lift off. So that friction would also go negligible. Do you agree? Point? Oh, at this point. Yes, absolutely. So there's going to be some force over here. All right. So which way? Which way are you trying to turn the wheel relative to the point? We're trying to go over the curve, right? So the wheel's trying to rotate this way. Which way would the friction go? Yeah. The opposite. And friction would be tangent to the circle, agreed? Good. Now I'm going to call that friction two for no good reason right now. There would have been friction at the bottom, but we right, friction one is also zero. What other force do we have here at this point? A normal force. But is it going to be this way or that way? Which way is it? Exactly. The disc is going to point that way. So by action reaction, it's towards the center. You caught it. I tried to trick you. I can't get anything past you guys. So I'll call that normal force too. So far, so good. In this case, what is the logical? Okay, are there any other forces here? Did we forget any? Does the wheel magically go over the curve by itself? The human being. What's the force? No. It's 2F because there's two wheels. 
And notice it said each whip. Do you agree? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And those little things start to add up, right? If each hand can do F, the total force is effectively 2F. Does that help? Now we've got some forces. Okay. Now you might be saying, this is not static equilibrium. The person's gonna go over the curve. But remember, we're doing a special limiting case. They're just barely not able to get over the curve. They're just barely not doing it. So the normal force is effectively zero and they're not rotating. Any larger force, they would get over. Does that make sense? So it is a static equilibrium problem. What's the logical choice of pivot point here? I can see two. Uh, I no, I see one. I don't want to suffer. Where would you pick as the pivot point for this problem? Oh, the, curve is right. the curve. Why is that useful? It gets rid of these two forces that I know nothing about and are at tough angles. Do you agree? And they would change as you go over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, again, we're sticking to our limited case if you aren't actually going over it. And then once you go over it, that would be a more complicated problem. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to choose this as the pivot point. Now, I know we haven't done this a lot. We choose this as the pivot point. That drops out those. I want you to see something here. What am I drawing for MG right now? Line of action. Line of action. And maybe just so this one stands out, I'm going to draw this one in a different color. And then I could draw the two lines of actions in different colors. Can anybody help me figure out this distance here? R perpendicular for MG. That's the lever arm for MG. Any ideas what that is? It's messy, isn't it? Any suggestions for what I should do instead of trying to do all this crap in one picture? Draw some extra pictures. This is too much. I can't do all this. I can't deal with it. So I, I'm going to draw a separate picture, right? Because then I'd have to do it for the, there's just no way. So let's draw the center of the circle, the center of mass. You know, mg is this way. Here's my pivot point. This is R perpendicular for MG. What's a good name for this side of the triangle? R. What's a good name for this side of the triangle? Nope. R minus, R minus H. Do you see that this side, the entire part is R. You subtract off the H, you get R minus H. You follow? Again, R minus H gives me this side. Take a second to confirm you're okay with that. What's our perpendicular then? In terms of R and H, what procedure would you do? Pythagorean theorem. Okay, okay. So how about I just say R perp? mg squared plus r minus h quantity squared equals r squared. Do you agree you can solve that for r perp? Let's do it. It's going to equal the square root of r squared minus You see how there's just a ton of geometry in this chapter? I'm going to foil that out. Right. 
right whiteboard. The R squareds drop. This becomes positive. Wait, that's a capital R. Sorry. So I think what we're going to get is H. Oh, geez, I'm, I'm doing too much in my head. I get 2RH minus H squared, which I have no idea what form is going to be the best. I'm just playing around here, getting it organized. Maybe this is going to be the way to go. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's this one. I don't know. I'm just feeling it out here. But I can factor out an H. And if I recall correctly, this last form ends up being the most useful, but I don't remember. I haven't done this problem in a year. What do you think? Why am I doing this? What's the point of our perpendicular? Do you remember? How does that help? No, that would be our perpendicular for the line of motion. This is to the line of action. So different. Line of action goes to a force, line of motion for angular momentum, right? It's similar to that. Yeah, the, the torque is going to be our perpendicular mg. So the torque for mg is just going to be this times mg. That's why we're doing that. Is that okay? It's a shortcut to get the torque. Crap. Well, let's do that 2F now. Here's 2F. Here's my pivot point. I know this distance here is H, that's the height of the curve. Here's my line of action. Is anybody feeling brave and want to come up and try and draw our perpendicular for me? Anybody want to try it? I want to get our perpendicular, yeah. Go for it. It's okay to be wrong, but it's more fun if you do it. They'll they'll pay attention more. That's absolutely it. That's it. It's hard. These markers suck, don't they? Yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. I'll do it. Let's give him a round of applause. He got the right R perpendicular. Good job. So I kind of have to like put a lot of muscle on it. Everything about this whiteboard is physically taxing. It's karmic payback for being so ruthless to you guys, right? I had to like grind everything out up here on the whiteboard. So, and now because it's so hard to see, let's just put it, you can actually see it. That's our perpendicular for 2F. Well, how long is that? 2R minus H. That's absolutely right. You agree this whole distance here is 2R, which means this distance right here must be 2r minus h. And I hope you could see now, if this has got a 2r minus h in it, and this does, that's why that form ends up being handy. What do you think? That lever arm trick is really handy for this problem. If you did not do the lever arms on this, you would have to figure out the angles for all these different, uh, uh, do you see what I'm saying? If you go back and look at some of the other problems we've been doing, sure, you can always use R, F, sine, theta, but sometimes it's a lot easier to break each force down, draw a line of action and figure out the lever arm and to have less thinking than trying to get all the angles. It's just six of one half a dozen the other. So far, so good. Okay, I'm going to write down the sum of torques for the wheel. And I'm going to, I'm going to try and do it on this board just because it's all here. Okay. 
how many torques are we going to have about this pivot point? Remember, this normal force is zero, so it's not going to do anything. How many torques are we going to have about this pivot point? This is so light. I'm going to draw it in here. How many torques about the pivot point? Two. So if this is just barely balanced, do you agree the magnitude of one torque must equal the magnitude of the other? Then I don't have to worry about this. So the magnitude of the torque due to 2F had better equal the magnitude of the torque due to Mg. And then I don't have to think about plus minus signs. It's like saying the ups equal the downs. The 2F equals the Mg torque. Well, this is going to be R perpendicular for 2F. This is going to be R perpendicular for Mg. At this point, we know the R perpendiculars. We know the forces. We can write all that crap in there. I think I could squeeze it in here. I'll write it up again up there at just a second. I'm doing this for the zoom. So R perpendicular for 2F was R perpendicular for MG was And now I'm going to rewrite this on the other board while the zoomers are doing that. I guess right. Right? Okay, now I'm going to switch over whiteboards. What are we trying to find? You remember? H, in theory, is everything else known in this equation. F is going to be something that we're going to study and learn about human beings. So F is going to be a number we get from some medical journal that studied how much force people can exert safely in a wheelchair. So that's going to be research. We'll get that number. R, the size of your wheelchair wheel, we can get that. MG, we can get a mass for a typical human being. All right, so we got everything. In theory, we should do this. What's the trick? How would you first attack this if you want to solve for H? Right, right. It's not what I would do. What's the worst part of this equation? The square root. The square root. What's the opposite of a square root? So let's square both sides and get rid of that and then start playing around. Now, I'm not saying what you said was wrong. You could move that over first and then square it. But at some point, we got to square this to get rid of that ugliness. So if you were thinking move this over, then yeah, that's totally great too. Should we do that? Let's do that. 2R minus H. Now notice I'm going to group the MG right here. Why would I do that? Why is this convenient to group it right there? Check the... What are the units of that? Nothing. So what we've done is we've taken terms that have units and then we've gotten rid of them so that now the only thing left is going to be centimeters or meters and we're good, right? Notice this has got meters squared in it, square root. This has got meters. It's going to work out. Now I'm going to square it. And we, what's that? Oh, MG is squared too, thank you. 
Absolutely. Thanks for catching that. Sorry about that. Now we see the advantage of playing around with that a little bit. What drops out? One of these ugly terms, right? So if we solve for H, no, because there's an H on the other side, you got to get all the H's together, but we're going to get there. It's a little bit of work, but it's, it's almost there. I'm going to rewrite. what I don't know, whatever there's, there's probably smarter ways to do the algebra at this point i just want this damn problem done probably would have been better to keep that in parentheses and keep the squared outside right but whatever yeah that was done I keep changing things on you. Basically, I just put this thing in parentheses and reorganized it. This has no units, no units, looking good. Whatever, you don't have to solve it this way. You could have just left it in those terms. So, so that you don't feel uncomfortable. The other way to solve it would be two times the radius or the diameter times, what was it? Four F squared over m squared g squared that's another way to write it all over if you were a computer science major what would you do with this make it easier to compile and waste less memory and cs majors here yeah what's that you but what I would do is, couldn't you divide each term by this? And then there's just a little bit less math in the code and it compiles just a little faster. So just getting crazy here. This would be 2R over M squared, G squared, over 4F squared plus 1. Notice that's just a little bit cleaner function to shove in the code. It's not required. What do you think? You Do a lot of these problems now. If you're an engineer and have to take statics, you will get much better at this. So that's I think that's enough said. Cool. At this point, you just got to practice some on your own. I've shown you every single variation of trick I could possibly think of. Oh, um, what's going to be on your test? You're probably either going to have a beam or something that's got a circle in it, right? If you look at the old practice test, it's about half the time it's half and half. Um, so if you want some problems, uh, look, look at, uh, for example, 12.9 or 12.10. We did not do those. Those are good problems because you haven't done them, but the techniques are very similar, right? Those are the beam problems. Look at 12.12 .12 down at the bottom. That's one that's got a spool, right? So you've got some... You got to think about circles again. Okay. There's a wall there. The ladder problem is a good one. Oh, yeah. Check out 12.18 on page 107. That was a test question once. That's another one that you can use for practicing your geometry. It's basically, if you can write the force equations and the torque equations and get the right angles in each, you're going to rock this question. So you just gotta practice the FBD part. 
And now I want to do a bonus question for fun. Look at 106, problem 12.16. Remember earlier in the semester, I said we were going to use fictitious forces one time. Fortunately, we have 20 minutes left in class. I'm going to do that. I'm going to erase the board for a sec. You guys can read that one. 12.16. I really like this problem. Uh, I'll explain it in a minute. Let me get the board right. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about stress and strain in a minute, okay? I want to uh, stop the live stream first, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right. Because these videos are going to be seen by future semesters, and I don't want to say something on the video that may not apply to all semesters. Is that cool? Yeah. Because then I just have to answer those freaking questions in years and years and years. So I promise I will address that after I stop the live stream for this semester. And if you're watching this video in a future semester, you can tell that that's one of those topics that may or may not be on your test. And so we got to talk about that. So um, is that good enough on that for right now? All right. I promise we'll talk about it. I'd rather focus on this because I know this is on the test right away for every semester. 12.16, all right? There's a car. This is a rear view. Here's a top view. There's some circular track, not very circular. Here's the center of the circle. Here's the car. What type of friction exists between the wheels and the road? What type of friction is present between the wheels and the road for a normal car driving down the road? Kinetic friction or static friction? Static, static because remember the point of contact at the bottom of the wheel is not actually moving relative to the road. If the road speed matches the uh, wheel rotation speed. Okay, so what are the forces on the car? Because it's driving around in this circle. To be clear, it's driving around in this circle from here, be going into the page, then out, into the page, then out. What's one force on the car? Give it to me. Gravity, I like that one. Where does that act? The center of mass. There's an mg. Okay, what's another force on the car? Where does that act? From the wheels. Now, do you agree there's going to be one on each of the four tires? Let's just average that out and say it's right here. This is horrible color. Sorry, my bad. There's a normal force up. We'll just say on average, that's right at the center. 
at the foot, uh, at the base. What else? Friction, which way? Towards the center of the circle, you caught it. Absolutely, which is gonna be this way. There's the center of the turn. Is this thing accelerating? Yes. Yes, which way? Center. Towards the center, absolutely. Can we make an assumption? Constant speed? Just to simplify the problem. So it's tangential zero. What's that? So a tangential is zero. Awesome. Nice. Now, this is chapter 12. We're supposed to be talking about statics. Is this a static equilibrium problem right now, at least at first glance? Is the sum of force equal to zero for this object? No. But if you recall, the trick is you can use a fictitious FBD to transform this problem from accelerating to sum of forces equals zero. So in this case, do you remember which way the fictitious force points? Opposite the acceleration. In particular, what we're basically going to do, do you agree if I write the sum of forces towards the center, I would get F equals MAC. So what we do is we move this to the other side. That's equivalent to saying the AC is a force pointing the other way. So I'm going to draw a better FBD over here. Let's just draw this thing as a big box. Forget the tires. Okay, just draw a box. Trust me. Now I need to draw the forces exactly where they apply. There's MG at the center mass of the car. Probably not in the vertical center of the car because it's probably lower due to the drivetrain and all the crap underneath the car and all the weight is lower, but somewhere in there. There's a normal force up. There's a frictional force sideways. And now, does anyone remember how we do the fictitious force? Where does the fictitious force apply? Do you remember? If you had to guess. Where do, we know it's to the right, but is it down here? Is it up here? Where is the fictitious force applied? If you had to guess. Anywhere. Oh, at the center of mass. It's equivalent to a force at the center of mass. All right? So there's a fictitious force this way, MAC. And for the fictitious free body diagram, I'm going to, this drives me nuts, but I got to say it. It's not a real force, it's a fictitious force. But when we do that, now it's a static equilibrium problem. Isn't that cool? This is amazing. You can take problems which are not static equilibrium and do static equilibrium math if you use fictitious forces. That's a big deal. We can now analyze this car's motion and figure out when it will tip instead of slip, right? How fast do you have to go before you tip over? Give me a good pivot point, people. Okay, so if we do right at the center mass, ooh, we gotta be a little bit careful here, don't we? Now I should probably be clear. I'm gonna do it like this. I better draw the wheels. Do you agree the frictional force is not right in the middle? It's actually at each wheel? Yeah. All right, we better do that. So let's draw really skinny wheels. How about that? Okay. If this car was going to tip over, which way would it tip? It would tip, yeah. Think about this. Isn't this a force that's causing it to twist that way? So if it's about to tip, the normal force is actually right here on this wheel. And the frictional force is all coming from these tires. 
So it's not actually right at the center anymore if it's about to tip. So to be clear, that helps us solve this problem. Do you agree this problem is screaming out for some lever arms? You could get a line of action here. You could get a line of action here. We could do a pivot point right here, get rid of the two forces we don't care about. And I see that MGX, where X is this distance. Has to equal M A C Y. The M's drop out. I get GX equals V squared over R times Y. This tells me something about the largest speed you can drive before you tip over. So I get R G X over Y square root equals V max before tip. X and Y are the center mass coordinates of your vehicle. Right? Check this out. What shape do sport cars tend to have? What, what, or like, let's say you want a car that's going to corner very well, right? What's generally true about cars that corner very well? Are they tall or short? Short. short. Maybe you've seen sports cars in the movies or whatever. They're always like, very low to the ground. Why does that help? Why is a small number, small number in the denominator gives you a larger V max before you tip over, right? What about X? If we want X, do, if we want to avoid tipping over, what do we want X to be? Do we want X to be a big number or a small number? Big. You want a large wheelbase, low to the ground, and you can go screaming fast, right? The physics is there. Oh, I've got seven minutes. Now we can do, okay, so, oh my gosh, I'm tired. That was exhausting. Oh my gosh, let me do this. Um, and it, that's kind of interesting, right? The, the, the possibilities are endless with physics. You can learn a lot of stuff. Enough set on static equilibrium. Page 99, look it over, do those practice problems, do as many as you can stand, you know, you got to do, the test is coming up, so 9, 10, 11, and 12, on the score Monday, we've got all day tomorrow, you can come in that lab and just do whatever you want, I'll have Zoom open too, and just study, study, study your brains out, got it? Finals coming a couple weeks later, all the stuff is on the final too, um, generally speaking on the final, I'm a little bit nicer and a little bit more mellow, but there's more questions, but each one's easier. So expect test three to just be a punch to the gut. Just study your brains out for it. And hopefully you'll just rock it. And then the final will be a little bit, a tiny, tiny bit easier. Don't want to be telling you I'm going to be easy. It's not going to be that easy.